I am thrilled to have Betsy Sweet from Moose Ridge Associates with us today to talk about the state budget, which is really confusing. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait I am, to learn from you. I am thrilled to be here with you <laughs> and try and uh, provide some clarity, I guess, on the budget and what's happening. So thanks. It's great to be here. And thanks, everybody, for joining. So um, well, this, maybe we should just start with where we are right this minute, because <laughs> we are right in it right now. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I wonder if you will, would just take, you know, one minute before we jump in to describe the difference between, like, the regular budget and the supplemental budget, or or maybe that is the where we are right yeah, now. Yeah, that is where we are, but let me absolutely. Great. So, Perfect. so every, you know, the governor submits a budget every two years, and that is the budget, that's the outline for how we're going to spend money for the next two years. So Governor Mills has submitted her budget for the next two years. Awesome. But during those two years, at either the first year or the second year, there has to be changes in spending. Sometimes because we lose money, like we have in this past and during the pandemic. Sometimes it's because some priorities change or there's urgent things that need to happen, like the CDC needs more money or we need more vaccine money or whatever, um, or we're out of money in X account or Y account. So, so they, uh, the governor then can submit at the beginning of either the first or second year of the biennial budget, a supplemental budget. And that what that does is it changes what they had passed the two year for the two year you know, overall plan, right? So I mean, it's similar to a, a home budget, you know, you have a budget and then the furnace breaks. And so all of a sudden you have to, <laughs> you have to switch things around. So, so that's basically what, what the supplemental budget does. Now, right now we are at the end of a biennial, of the a biennial budget, which ends. So the main budget goes from July to July. So we are at the end of a biennial budget. <clears throat> it will be over July 1st of this year. And so this supplemental budget is only spending between now, March, end of March or middle of March, when this hopefully gets passed and the end of July. That's the only thing it's going to affect. Now, one of the problem and what, and that's also the reason that they need a two thirds budget is so for anything to go into effect immediately, which right, um, it has to be by two thirds. If they waited and said did it by majority, and then it, you know, they went, um, it would only take effect 90 days afterwards, which would put us past the end of the of the budget of the budget. So it wouldn't help us at all. Does that make sense? Okay, so a regular, the regular budget is the two year budget. Supplemental budget is the correction budget. Okay. Yep. Typically, the regular budget can just pass with a majority, like 50%. Well, it can. Yes, it can, but they generally don't. Because okay. in, in order for that to pass and take effect as of July, it would have to be done by April 1st. And I uh. think with the exception of maybe two or three years in my almost 40 years, they can never get their work done. <laughs> but, you know, and, and there's a lot there. So I'm not, it's not a criticism, but it's just, it, you know, so so generally those are done by two thirds as well. And I know okay. Governor Mills- So then a, a budget could pass by 50%, but it's mm -hmm. all about timing. It's about when it passes. Right. And so if it's too close to the deadline, then it has to be two thirds. And that's right. why. And I would say that politically, most governors, and I know Governor Mills, feel it strongly that it should be a two thirds budget. So, um, so that's where we are. So, <clears throat> so that gets us to today. So right now at the Civic Center, they are trying to pass the supplemental budget for this, for, from now, tomorrow, if they pass it today, until the end of July, has to be by two thirds. And last night, the Senate passed it by two thirds, but the House has not passed it by two thirds. So, um, and the hill to climb in the House, because the margin between Democrats and Republicans is much slimmer than it is in the Senate. And so in the Senate, they only had to get two votes to get to the two thirds. In the house, they have, I don't I haven't done the math, but they have to get a lot more. <laughs> so they have to get, they have to get to 101 and um, they're at like 79. So they have to get, you know, whatever, 22 votes, uh, 22 Republican votes. So, um, so that's where we are. I don't know if it makes sense. So let me stop there. If you have questions about that process, I can tell you what the, some of the holdups are if you want to hear about that as well. 
I think that all that all makes sense. I think that those the fact that there are two different types of budgets and the fact that there are two different types of voting, a 50% or a two thirds, mm -hmm. I think they're really confusing for some people. So yeah. I appreciate you like taking the time to clarify. And so now we're just looking at a couple of months budget. So right. and we need to have, they need to have all of the Democrats plus 20 odd Republicans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so. I don't see questions specifically about that in the chat right now. Um, and so, yeah, tell, tell us what, what's so, the delay. Okay, so it's a little bit curious to me, actually. Again, I've been doing this for <laughs> a really long time. Um, and I sort of consider myself one of the, uh, someone who has made it my business to really learn about the budget and the budget process, because it's so important to what, all, everything we care about. Um, so right now, the places of disagreement, right? So the vast majority of this budget, they agree on. But there are two holdouts right now, um, and it, which is what, what they're trying to negotiate around to get to the two thirds. So one is what's called tax conformity. And that is the Republicans are con insisting that there be tax conformity with the federal tax code, right? around specifically around the pandemic stuff right so one of the things and this is in the news all over the place was when it looked like that the pandemic aid that companies that com corporations had gotten was going to be taxed by the state not by the feds but by the state and so bringing that into conformity with the feds meant that we weren't going to we aren't going to tax that money on the state level so that's already been dealt with they already did it so they're going to no one no one is going to get taxed on that money governor mills put a compromise a proposal in that let about 98% of the businesses off, that didn't fly with the Republicans. So now it's 100% tax conformity, which costs about $100 million. <clears throat> There's one other piece of tax conformity that has that we have not agreed to. And that is, <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. That is the deduction for business expenses, the most common of which is the what's known as the three martini lunch, but as you know, is the lunch expenses and meal expenses in old tax code, right? This is, you know, it, it, you, could, you could deduct 50% of that. But under the COVID relief thing that Trump passed, under Trump, they expanded that to 100%. So the feds have kept it at 100%. The state budget is saying, no, we are not gonna give people a hundred percent tax break on what you and I, I think most of us would consider um, frivolous uh, business expenses like lunches and meals out and that kind of stuff. You get 50% still, but you can't take a hundred percent. This and a couple of other of those kinds of things are worth $32 million. So actually the Republicans are pushing for $32 million more in spending than the governor mills and the democrats have currently proposed so that's one issue that's dividing them and that's what the house is standing their ground on the other is um on the money that tax relief money that's or the not tax relief the pandemic relief money that's going to come in they want to have what however that's dispersed be voted on by two-thirds of the legislature house and senate Currently, there's a law, in the, there's a part in the budget that says only 50%. Actually, currently, the governor has sole authority, executive authority. She doesn't have to come to the legislature at all. And in the last pandemic relief money, she didn't. She just, you know, they weren't in session. So she just, she determined how money was going to be spent. And that is by law. Okay. The Democrats said, no, 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 no. You know, we want you to come to the legislature and talk to us about how you're going to distribute this money. And so, that, but it was by majority, not by two thirds. And the Republicans are saying, no, 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 you, not only do you have to come talk to us, but you have to pass it by two thirds. So that's what they're holding, that's what's, what's holding this supplemental budget up right now. So <clears throat> now there's all kinds of, what happens now is all this stuff behind the scenes where there's all kinds of horse trading and trying to figure out what is it that somebody needs? What is it that some Republicans need in order to you know, say, I'm gonna vote for this? And um, 
so you know that's sort of where we are and that you know the horse trading is continuing so if you were at the civic center which none of us are allowed to be at right now because of covid but if you were there you would see a lot of downtime you would see a lot for rank and file members for all the 151 members in the house and the 35 members in the house and the senate you would see them hanging around a lot as some of this trading is going on what happened in the senate was there was um uh, a, led, a senator who wanted some money for a veterans memorial hundred and thirty thousand dollars <laughs> and so when he was promised that then he just agreed to vote for the budget and um, for the supplemental budget and so that's how they got this two-thirds in the senate so now we don't know what, what they're you know trying to get at um, i think the democrats are pretty stalwart in terms of not giving in on this full conformity on mar three martini lunches and that kind of stuff um because they just feel like like in a time you know in covid like what that should not be paying that's not where our money should be going it should be going to more dire need so so yeah that's what's i think what's happening as far as i can tell so far <laughs> from from uh, watching it on zoom um so but that's what are, I think are you tempted to go over to the civic center parking lot and just <laughs> roll around <laughs> i actually thought about like maybe i could stand outside and hand out hand sanitizer or or you know wrapped up cookies or something <laughs> something that was covid safe that i so would just smile and answer them see if i could pick up on any of the uh anything but no no they, we decided that would be uh frowned upon <laughs> it would hurt us more than help us right so that's where we are right now focused on the supplemental budget yeah. but i know that the regular budget is also being constructed as we speak yes. And so you had mentioned that the governor submits that uh, her proposal for the regular budget. Mm -hmm. And then a whole lot of things happen over many months. <laughs> yes. What does that process look like? So, you know, the adage is the governor proposes, the legislature disposes. So, so the governor pr presented her two year budget, um, you know, and this year was a little tricky not knowing what was going to come down from fed the federal government and still we're you know we're still in the throes of that but the the, the process is she presents it to the legislature the appropriations committee hears the budget so there was tons of weeks and weeks of and they might still be going a little bit of public testimony where we get to go and say hey this doesn't work or this is we love this or we don't love that or you know whatever um so we get to do all that and then and those hearings generally happen as joint hearings with both the Appropriations Committee and the committee that focuses on that issue. Is that largely correct? Exactly. Okay. Yes, that's correct. It's a Health so and Human Services. Right. And those people are hearing it as well. Right. Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Yes. That's, so they all have a joint hearing in which the, in which the, uh, the administration explains any changes to the budget. And then the public is allowed to comment. We like these changes, we don't like these changes, that kind of thing. Then that, those sections of the budget are parsed out to those committees. So for example, the Health and Human Service Committee has been meeting for weeks to now dig deeper into those policy issues and what the implications are of the budget in those policy issues. Same is true in corrections and in inland fisheries and wildlife and in taxation. And you know, so it goes, it, it gets parsed out to those committees. Those committees then take votes and report back to appropriations. So appropriations then receives all the reports from all the 13 standing committees, and then they have to put it all together. So then they have to vote on whether or not they support the recommendations of the committees or not support the recommendations of the committees. And then the other thing that I, we didn't mention, I didn't mention early on, I should have, is that you know by con main constitution, our budget has to be balanced. Unlike the federal government that can, you know, go into a deficit spending we can't do that so whatever we have has to balance out that means that it's a combination of the money that we have the revenues that we have and um you know and that gets that changes as the budget goes along you know and the revenue projections were up um and so um anyway so we so there's that and then um there's the different what people think about the proposals now, some of the recommendations from the committees come back unanimously. Some of them come back divided. Some of them come back divided along party lines, you know? And so it's like, there's a lot of things that happen 
in this putting together this quilt <laughs> uh, that's a nice way to say it <laughs> sausage maybe is more accurate um, of the of what finally happened so um, so we are in that process right now most of the committees are parsing out and doing the dig the deep dive actually into their parts of the budget and they start reporting back I believe next week to appropriations then appropriations takes all that they try and then they go over those reports they try and put it together depending on what they accept and reject then they come up with the bottom line are they above or below then they have to go back in and you know either cut more or get to add more usually it's the former um, and then that's when leadership gets involved so democratic and republican leadership then gets with, together with appropriations and then they put that all together and they end up with a balance but a, a balanced budget and then ideally a budget that gets unanimous approval or will get two thirds in both the House and the Senate. And meanwhile, so that is how the, the full budget is constructed. But meanwhile, committees are hearing policy proposals that may not have a budgetary impact. Mm -hmm. And so when a bill is proposed that has a budgetary impact or what we call a fiscal note it goes to the committee that oversees that issue area yep. and then goes to appropriations yep. when and how do those get knitted into the quilt okay great great question <laughs> and there's a formal process and an informal process right the formal process is that those bills get voted on by the house and senate chambers first and um and then they will um then before they're finally vote, uh, enacted, they get set aside and put on the appropriations table. So there's a thing called the table. And every bill that has the fiscal note sits on the appropriations table. Now, and then I, the way the formal process works is after the budget is done, whatever money is left over, they try and leave money left over. Then they, let's say they have $10 million left over. Then they go to the table and they take all those bills and then they set up the priorities and um, they say, okay, we're going to fund this off the table. We're going to fund this off the table and this off the table. And then those pass, then they go back upstairs and they get their final enactment. The informal process is, um, is that those um, bills, the sponsors of those bills and people on appropriations committee try and pull those bills into the budget. And so they try and get, so if you, if we, if I have a bill on appropriations that I'm working on, I work really hard to get it off the table and into the budget before the budget is passed, because there's generally not a lot of money on the table and there generally is huge competing priorities. So we try and weave it into the actual budget. So that, I mean, there's a, a, there's a number of avenues and if you can't weave it into the budget, then you work hard on the table. And then, you know, so, I mean, you have, in some ways it's good because you got a lot of bites at the apple um but uh it you know it's it's, right. very, it's a very difficult process <laughs> there are a couple questions here about specific issue areas yeah. but, um before we jump over to those and so apologies to those folks in the chat just to stick with the theme here yeah. um one of the questions is when should we expect the public hearings on the proposed budget but i think those have largely already occurred or are nearing their end. Yeah, those are all, those have already happened. There might be one or two committee, um, uh, parts of the budget left, but um, yeah, but that, that's already done. So now those, now there's work sessions happening in all the committees um, and then those will come back. So basically the public input now, now that we can have is individual members of committees. So now is when we can talk to the individual members of committees and say, oh my gosh, referring to another, you know, there's not enough money for community mental health in this budget. What are we going to do? You know, and oh my gosh, you know, we haven't done enough to pay direct care workers for elderly and disabled folks who are getting home care services. You know, what are we going to do? And so now they will take up whatever our concerns are, most of which have been voiced at the public hearing and then try to encourage them, you know, into, you know, encourage to get those in there either report back if it's happening at the policy committee level or in appropriations if it's happening at the appropriations level. Mm. Does that answer that? I think so. Sort of? I think so. <laughs> uh, Raise your hand if it's like, clear as mud. 
I think your comment though about lots of bites of the apple. So to folks who want to have a part in this process and you know want to to be sort of members of the public, it happens in lots of different ways over many months, is what you're describing. So there's the mm -hmm. sort of at the beginning of the process more technical. Um, and in those hearings, but then there's always an opportunity to be reaching out to your legislators and advocating. Yes, yes. And, you know, I've seen legislators do amazing things. You know, somebody who's like dogged about uh, making sure that, you know, uh, um, I don't know, that the paid family leave gets funded, right? They, then, then we get people to organize around that, make sure they're calling their legislators and then legislators, you know, so if you're not on that 13 member appropriations committee or in leadership in the House, in the, in the House and Senate, both Republican and Democrat, those are the, that's the team basically, but that does the final stuff. So then we also get legislators to advocate to those people, you know, to make sure that, you know, to, so, so yeah. <laughs> and so then for the folks who want to be engaged from the front end, because that is one of those questions. Um, you can follow along with the, um, you know, Appropriations and, and Financial Affairs Committee. You can get on the interested parties uh, mailing list, and then you'll get an email every week that tells you what's coming up for the week to come. Mm -hmm. Are there ways that you would suggest people stay connected with the public hearings? Well, I, every, like, Sunday night, um, I go to the legislative page, www.maine.gov slash legislature, and then I go to the committees that I care about. So I go to appropriation, or I, I go to appropriations, and I look at what their schedule is for the week. It's right there. So in case I didn't get the interested parties memo, and then if you don't, if you don't see it there, um, well, no, then you, so you'll find it, you'll, you can go to that committee and it'll say the hearings for the following week, and that's where you find it. So I just go check, you know. I think probably I have four or five committees that I, um, most of the stuff I work on is, it goes to. So I just go look at their, um, you know, I go look at the, what's happening there and um, that's how we stay on top of it. And Elena has dropped in a link to our citizen advocacy page, which has some how to's about um, finding committees, finding schedules. And I will also add one about getting on the interested parties mailing list. Cause I do think that's helpful. Yep, it is helpful. A couple specific questions here. Um, people interested in the status of funding for uh, community mental health and for um, in-home care and direct care workers and those reimbursement rates. Do you have any updates for us on those? A little bit. I have a little bit of update. Um, so yeah, this is a huge problem that I work on myself um, a lot, um, particularly on the mental health side, but I'm in working in coalition with folks working for the DD population, the disability population, and the elderly population. We have a crisis in direct care work. Um, I mean, we aren't paying enough. People need it more than ever. Um, and I'm sure I'm, whoever asked the question, Jeff or anybody else, you know this. And um, it's undervalued work, even though those are essential workers and all that kind of stuff. So um, we have been pushing very hard. There are, I think, 28 pieces of legislation that um, tr tr are to increase rates for all of these services, of, of usually one at a time. In this budget, in the supplemental budget, we succeeded in getting $10 million in state money, um, which will be matched by about $20 million in federal money. So we have an additional $30 million between now and the end of July, I mean, end of June, for direct care workers in all three, all of those categories. Um, now, uh, and then we have to stay on top of the department to actually get that money out, <laughs> um, which has been a challenge. Um, there is not, there was not, uh, for, for the developmentally disabled population in um, certain sections, there was, there is, um, there is proposed increases in the governor's biennial budget, but only for that population. So there is nothing for the elderly, there's nothing for community mental health. Um, and um, so there's, again, it's developmentally disabled. You know, they're saying it's because they've done a rate study there and they know there's a rate study about these other ones. Um, and, you know, I, I could spend a whole hours talking about why they're inadequate rate studies. But um, so we're, we're fighting. And I just want to say um, I really am working hard. I've also met with uh, members of the administration 
to look at basically treating direct care workers like we've treated teachers and also to do what I, the Davis-Bacon Act, some of you know what the Davis-Bacon Act is, I know Jeff does, but um, you know, when we actually said it had, people had to be paid a prevailing wage, so it just took a whole class of people and moved them into the middle class, basically. And I think it's time to do that with direct care workers. You know, just like we said, teachers, a minimum was $40,000. We have to figure out what that hourly minimum is. I don't know what that number is. It could be $20 an hour, it could be $25 an hour, it could be 18, I don't know. But we decide that and then we say every direct care worker in every sector is going to start with that as base pay. Because what happens is if we, let, let's, and this has happened in the last 10 years, they decide, they make the Sophie's choice of who's most important. So in this particular budget, it's developmentally disabled people. Definitely they need help. Definitely they need uh, increase in wages 100%. But what happens when we only increase their, the wages for the, those direct care workers, then anyone who's working in mental health or for elderly just moves because there's always, there's always job openings and they move over there because that's where the money is. And you can't blame them. And so it's just this like, it's this ridiculous back and forth. So which is why I think we have to do this. I think it's a brilliant economic strategy. I think it's a, I mean, I think we're gonna see, um, I, I just think it's a really great, I think it's a great political strategy and it's really important for both the workers and all the families that they serve um, and the people that they serve and their families and everything. So we're not there yet. Um, so I think we will probably piece together whatever we can um, to try and increase wages. I am hopeful there is in the in the COVID relief money, and I know someone asked about the um, the COVID the federal money. Uh, there is some very specific uh, help for uh, direct care workers for uh, behavioral health, um, DV health, and elderly health and home care stuff. So I'm hoping that that money, but that's temporary. You know, I mean it's two years temporary, which is awesome. It's better than nothing. But we're going to have to figure out how to sustain that as we go forward. So um, you know, it's 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 a I feel like it is like the most tough uh, mosaic of trying to put together these pieces because I think we are, those services are always, excuse me, we always love them and have days for them where we tell them how wonderful they are, but we don't pay them. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real travesty, I think, for those workers and for the people that they serve. Well, uh... To the federal COVID relief money, and we're, we're right at the end of our time, but okay. I think that's what's being uh, debated right now in the budget is... Well, it's just how, but like the actual, um, it's, yeah, and so, um, so to Rich, you know, the, it, the, the, we're going to have to stay on top of it. The answer is we don't really know. So, yeah. you know, when, I just want to say that the, when the papers announced yesterday we were going to get $6 billion dollars. That six billion is going to come in in lots of ways, much of which is very prescriptive. So it's going to come in through unemployment and through the uh, stimulus checks. The amount of money that's going to be in the state budget is about 1.8 billion, okay? Which is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And so what they're arguing about right now is how much say the legislature is going to have in distributing that money. And so um, my my guess is that that money will come in it's going to get mixed into this into the budget it's going to get mixed into this biennial budget first because the money's for two years and second because they will use that money you know they're going to try and find, pick out the things that are one-time things in this budget in the current state budget pay for that with covid money if it obviously if it meets the guidelines which will then free up some general fund money to do other things so it is going to be a jigsaw puzzle like we have never seen before and i think we're going to have to stay right on top of it so go to the advocacy piece <laughs> and that uh, Elena dropped in the chat because we are going to have to be be on this like you know we're going to stick to it um even more than we do to the regular budget because it's a lot of opportunity it's a lot of budget have to, it, to do a lot of things and so you know we have to make our voices loud and clear well, maybe we'll have you back uh, to talk. I'm happy to come back anytime. More about budget and federal spending when we know more in a couple of months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think we're at the end of our time, but um, I really thank you for this. I think it was super helpful. Um, we'll we'll share this video, and I hope to see people next week as well. We have. Uh, Quinn Gormley from Maine Transnet and uh, Gia Drew from Equality Maine talking about the anti-trans sports bills. And then the following week we have Representative Faye and 
uh, Jess Maurer from the Maine Council on Aging, specifically talking about those direct care bills. Care workers. So. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you everybody for being with us. And um, yeah, and uh, come back anytime and please stay engaged. <laughs> we need you. Thank you so much, Betsy. Have a great day to everyone. So glad you could all be here.